Hey there, I had a chance to get my hands on the new Garrett Axiom. It's their pulse induction technology gold machine. It's a serious contender, one of the better gold machines out there on the market right now. And I had a chance to open it up, do an unboxing video for you, and I only had it for one night. So I went through all the menu, and the, what I'm gonna show you in that menu kind of covers the whole owner's manual. So if you're thinking about getting one of these, or you already own one, and you wanna know, you know how to set it up and how to run it, and what the settings are like, stay tuned and we'll dig right in. All right, so I got the new Garrett Axiom here. Went down to pick this up at the hardware store yesterday in Placerville from my buddy Albert. It belongs to one of our club members actually, a buddy of mine, Tom, that's in our detecting club. Bought this from Albert and gave me permission to go ahead and open it up and show it to you guys and maybe do a little walkthrough on the menu system, but we will not take it out in the field. I'll let Tom do that. And if he wants to invite me out on a hunt, pretty soon we'll get out in the field and swing it alongside the 6,000 and compare some targets and stuff and have fun with it. But until then, I'm just gonna kind of show you a little unboxing of it here. And uh, we'll start by showing you the box. And you can see the box is not sealed from the factory. It would just open right up. But here is the front of the box. Here's the back. Pretty cool. Features on here. Ultra Pulse Technology TerraScan Ground Balance System. Choose your scan speed from slow, medium, and fast. Noise elimination and extreme battery life. 16 hours on one charge. How awesome is that for a PI machine? It's got this part here. You can see the footprint of this thing. It's a really cool, futuristic looking machine. Very sleek and space-like looking. And not only form, but even just in color. It just looks like something that you would see in Star Wars. All right, let's go ahead and open it up and see what's inside. Oh, <laughs> was not expecting that. There's a bag in here and the machine must be in this bag. Look at this. Okay, that's all that's in the box. All right, let's get the box off the table here and take a look at this bag. There is a bag in the box. First of all, it's a backpack. Look at that. With a chest, with a uh, bra strap, they call that, on the front. So you can um, wear this as a backpack and take it out. It's a tough Cordura-like material. The zipper goes all the way around. There's a handle here. These are padded, but not very padded. They're pretty thin. They're not, not very comfortable feeling as far as the padding goes. There's some mole stitching on here that you could mount something on maybe. A couple straps. And um, all the sewing looks pretty good and reinforced up here on this part. And not only is there a side handle, but there is a top handle. So yeah, it looks good. This is stitched in, Garrett metal detector stitched into the, into the material. Let's go ahead and unzip it. All right. All right, let's take this coil out. Oh, it's coil cover. Yep, that's a coil cover. Not much to look at there. Very thin skid plate. Paper here. All right. Let's see if we can open this up. The bubble wrap is has some adhesive on it. This is the battery pack. So this type of battery pack here is not the rechargeable. This would just take regular AA batteries 
So this would be a alkaline pack that you could have with you and have even more battery time, I suppose, by bringing some alkaline batteries along. Or if you're unable to get to a place where you can charge the machine, you could just run it with this. Got some headphones here. Take a look at these. So first impressions on the headphones is they're, they're very heavy and well-built filling. They, they got a little weight to them. Really nice up here on the top, super padded. The ears are plush in like a faux leather. Very comfortable. These are the MS3 using the Garrett Z-Link technology, which is wireless, obviously. And um, if you watched my video on the Ace Apex, you've already seen these and same headphones on the AT Max as well. All right, what do we got here? This little black box on the end here, it's attached to the case. So let's, let's take the Velcro off and see what's in here. I assume this is the charger, wall charger. It is, you got some international plugs in here. Yep, it's a wall charger in here. Okay. Put that back in there. And then here's the coil. So there's two coils. I did not know this. This is actually something I did not realize. This is an 11 inch coil. And then this looks like it's gonna be a 14 in here as well. So there's two coils. That is awesome. Let's take a look at the 11 inch coil real quick. So the boot coming up on this is pretty short, but the cable is super thick. So the boot's a little short, but it's in, you know, off the edge pretty good, but it's, there's not a lot of a big rubber boot on that. It's short and thin, but the cable is a high quality cable. It's got that screw in connector that we're familiar with. Axiom 11 inch mono. And it has the skid plate or coil cover already on it. It's very light. It's more light than you might think. All right, let's go see what else is in here. We got this part over here. This is a quick start guide and some cables, coil bolt. Take a look in here real quick. See what these cables are. So typical charging cables for the headphones and the machine. Coil bolt and washers. And then there's a headphone user's guide in here. Owner's manual for the headphones in color. All the information you might need for that. And then there is a quick start guide in here for the machine. Let's take a look at this real quick. Actually, you can see it through here. Battery charging, adjusting the arm cuff, assembly, quick start. I can see that stuff already. It's got multiple pages. Warranty information. Make sure you do your warranty when you buy this. And there's not a lot in here, just four pages. This, this, and these two. So, I don't see an owner's manual for the machine. I'm sure that could be acquired online like most other manufacturers are doing nowadays. They're not putting owner's manuals in the packaging. They're asking you to go online and download them. I'm gonna put all this back in here real quick. I'm trying to be kind of careful because like I said, I'm borrowing this from Tom, so. The machine is Velcroed in. You got a little Velcro strap here. We'll undo that and see if it'll lift out now. Yes, it will. Take this off and There's a lot of weight back here. There's a lot of weight right here, more weight than, than I thought there'd be. But I'm also thoroughly, absolutely impressed with the build quality on this already. It is built like a tank. I mean, literally just built to last. And it 
handle feels pretty good. It's got that little stop right here that kind of stops your hand from coming up, which I like. And when you have the machine in the proper angle looking down, it's got a good view, a good view of a good angle of uh, view for the control head on that. And there's a system down here that's, wow, look at this. So it has these um, trapezoid style shape on these on these shafts. And let's see, we'll open this up a little bit. Nice. So with this thing fully extended, boy, that's all the shaft you'd ever need on this thing, man. I'll tell you, that's, look at the length of this. I don't know if you guys can realize how long the length of this shaft is, but it's way longer than the 6,000 or the 7,000 by Mind Lab. And let's be honest right now, I mean, when you're looking at this machine, you're, you're comparing it to, by the way, I noticed with this thing locked out, that the pins dropped in and even with the with this open it doesn't move until you push the pin which i like it's a double locking system so let's go ahead and close that and let's do the same here there we go but like i said we're, we're comparing this to the 6000 the gpx 6000 and the gpz 7000 and I mean, just my biggest complaints about the 6000 already are how thin the shaft is and how much movement you get down there and, and how it twists on itself. And at this end on my 6000, this piece right here where it's connected has already broke loose a few times on mine and I had to re-glue it back in. If you look at the design on this on the tip, that could never happen because of the angles they chose to cut back in on this carbon fiber. This could never spin in there, plus it's not round. Therefore, it could never spin anyway. So what a fantastic design. And these clamps are just military-like. I mean, this thing is a masterpiece in design from what I can feel. Only thing I don't like is um, I don't feel like I have Popeye arms or nothing, but it's tight. This, this area right here is really tight on my arm. And even with this kind of all the way out, it's tight on my arm. And it just doesn't feel like it was built for... A person with arms like mine and if I had a jacket or a flannel on I'd have trouble getting this on on my arm honestly I would have to try to figure out another way to get something bigger here because my arm just doesn't fit in there but once it's in there like this it fits fine just I wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to wear a jacket or a flannel shirt so anyway thoroughly impressed right now with just looking at this thing and holding it the build quality it is a little heavy but we'll see how that translates to balance uh, right now, I can feel that it feels like most of that weight is hanging right here on this strap. So maybe it's balanced just fine. All right. One last thing in the box here to take a look at, which is the big coil. And I guess it is a 14-inch coil. Super lightweight again, lighter than you might think. Same cable, same small little thin rubber boot here. I don't know if that has been a problem or if it could be a problem or not, but I just hate to see manufacturers not pay attention to this area. I would like to see a nice, big, thick, heavy cable stay down here to protect it, a bigger boot. And this just doesn't have it. But it's um, a no-nonsense design. Like I said, it's a lot lighter than you might think. And I, I have a feeling that this thing's gonna be very well balanced when it's all put together. And I correct myself, it is a 13-inch double D, not a 14. 13 inch double D and that's everything in the box. So we will um, go ahead and set this thing all up and turn it on and go through some menu settings and stuff and kind of do a walkthrough of it next. But as far as unboxing goes, that's kind of what I have to show you so far. I'll try to get some close-ups, some nice photography of some of this stuff so you can see the quality on this. Like I said, it's very Star Wars like. It's very futuristic looking and can't wait to try it out in the field. This is raised, by the way. This is not a decal. You can feel the letters are raised in the plastic, molded in. This is a tampo or decal back here. Got a couple um, plugs back here. And they seem to be one for headphones and one for the charger. Not sure um, yet 
how the battery system works. I know we had that other battery, we'll kind of look into that, but I have a feeling that it goes on the bottom down here and locks in here as a spare battery, but I'm not sure about that. Anyway, um, I guess that's about it. There's no trigger on here or nothing. And on the back of the control head, I just have the input for the coil. I don't see any way to update it, so it's probably not updatable. Could be wrong about that. That could be through here. Not sure about that, but uh, nothing obvious though. So, all right guys. So that's it for the unboxing on the new Garrett Axiom. All right, so I have the machine powered on. I did that by hitting this button right here in the bottom left-hand corner. That's the power on and off button. And just like with any Garrett machine, if the machine is off and you hold the power button in and keep it held in, it'll do a factory reset on it. And then once the machine is on like this, if you were to be in some other menu, like say for example, you're changing the volume, this button over here by tapping it is just the operate screen. It takes you right back to the screen you're seeing right now, which is your main detect screen. And if you were hold it in, it would shut the machine off. All right, and then we have an up and down for the volume. We have an up and down for the sensitivity, up and down for threshold, a ground balance over here in the bottom right. And then down here we have our menu button, which also has a dual function. Going back over here just for a second to the ground uh, balance, if you were to hold that in and pump the coil from one to six inches, your typical ground grab kind of thing is how that works. But there's also ground tracking. We'll talk more about that later. And when you're in this screen right here, you can see there's a bunch of stuff on the screen. On the left, it says mode salt. And then there's a little graph up at the top there that's wiggling around a little bit, the very top of the screen. And you got a couple of numbers. You got a 36 and a 19. Down below that, you have your sensitivity bar, which goes from one to six. And then you have your backlight, your battery, and it says ground track and on the right, slow. So let's go ahead and talk about some of these things real quick. The volume, we already talked about that. You turn it up and down here. Sensitivity, you would turn it up and down here. Again, I'm indoors, so I'm gonna turn it all the way down. Threshold goes way up there. Um, I have it all the way down at three. With the headphones on, three is all you needed to get a good threshold, so. I don't know why this number goes so high, but man, I guess without headphones, maybe you want it this high, but um, it goes all the way up to 25. So again, I found it useful just at three with headphones on. Let's go back out to the main detect screen. There we go. And then again, the ground balance, you would hold that in and pump the coil. And then once you're familiar with all this, let's go into the actual menu system. You click this button once and it takes you into this screen. And you can toggle through all this just by continuing to click the button and it just toggles through all these different parts. So the first one over here, mode, right now it's on salt. And if we hit the up button and go up to large and we got normal and fine. Down we got normal, large, salt. So these are the modes that tell the machine what kind of gold you're looking for. Do you want fine gold? Do you want normal size gold, large gold, or are you detecting in salt? Salt would be, for example, at the ocean where there's salt water on the wet beach, so you have salt in the sand, or let's say you live in Utah at the Great Salt Lake or the Bonneville Salt Flats or something, salt is in metal, it's a mineral, and machines are easily fooled by it, so that's a setting that you would use for that if you're gonna be um, in those kind of situations. And let me go back to that screen real quick. There we go, and we'll put it back on fine. And look, if you can run this machine on fine, you'd be doing really good because you're going to hear fine gold, you're going to hear medium gold, and you're going to hear large gold. But the problem is, is with it on fine, you're more likely and susceptible to ground mineralization issues, falsing, and hot rocks. So if you can't run it on fine and listen for fine gold, you might find yourself having to, they recommend that you do try that first. You might find that you have to go, let me go back to the screen here, might have to go down to normal. And then normal, you'll have less hot rocks, uh, less EMI, less falsing, but you're not going to hear the fine gold as much. And then if you're going down for large gold, you'll really knock out the hot rocks, the EMI, and their mineralization and falsing, but uh, you're going to miss out on the fine gold. So it's kind of a balancing act in there. And like I said, the Garrett recommends that you try to run it in fine mode if you can. 
as we go to the next thing, we got frequency scan. And if you hit the button right here, the center buttons, and do a frequency scan, it, it'll go for 45 seconds and start listening to every different frequency. I believe there's 99 different ones in there. And then it seems to settle on a few. And then it does one last check and it finally solves for one frequency that is the most stable and it'll just give you that frequency to work with. So that's something you're gonna to wanna to do at the beginning of every hunt, you're gonna to wanna to do this. And like I said, it's a pretty long process. It takes a while I'm trying to talk my way through it here for you. But like I said, when you first start out, you're gonna to wanna to turn the machine on and set the sensitivity as high as you can. They recommend that you run the sensitivity at full and a lot of people have no issues running this thing at full sensitivity, even in tough ground. So try that and then go ahead and do your uh, ground balance by holding this in, pumping the coil, and then do a frequency scan. So it chose frequency number 29. So now we'll go to the next thing here, which is tone. And that's a, it's on 50 by factory default, but you can actually change the tone and it's quite a big difference in, in a range. Let's take a look at that real quick. So with this button here, we go up, it goes all the way up to 99 and all the way down to one. And it does change the tone quite a bit. Let me turn the volume up so you can hear it. Like I said, that's factory default there. We'll go back to the operate screen, turn the volume up a little bit. And we'll go in here and go to the tone and turn it down. You can hear a big difference in tone. And we'll turn it up. I'm sure you can hear that. So you can set the tone wherever you want it. I'll put it back at factory default. And you know, it's a well-known fact that uh, as you get older, we don't tend to hear high tones very well. So if you're a little bit older, maybe you want to run that down a little lower or you can hear it better. So just a good option that they put in there for us to be able to change the tone. Back to the uh, settings again. Next thing down is audio. You have a couple different styles of audio in here. You know what, I'm gonna go back out and turn the volume up just one more time so I can show this to you. So the audio, you have the pulse wave modulation PWM like we're on right now, but there's also a VCO. So you can choose between those two, PWM or VCO. Uh, the PWM like it's on right now is your typical MindLab kind of sound like you would hear on the PI machines that MindLab makes. Let's turn that back down. And let's go back to the settings again. And the next thing over here is the headphones. You can see it's blinking. If I hit this button, it turns it on. And I can toggle back out with the other button. And I'm not gonna talk too much about that. The Z-Link system that Garrett uses is just foolproof. It just seems to work every time without any issues whatsoever. And what you would do is you just turn it on here, turn the headphones on, and within a second or two, they'll connect and end of story. No, nothing more to know about it than that. It's that simple. I'm not using the headphones right now, so I'll just shut that off. And the next thing is, is the backlight. Right now it's constant, it's on. If you hit this button here, you can shut it off. So it's blinking. And if you go back out to this, the text screen, you don't have a backlight. But as soon as you hit a menu button, the backlight comes back on for you. So we'll turn that back on so that when we go to the text screen, it's always on. Okay, next thing down there is speed. It's a swing speed. And this is kind of tricky stuff here because what you're doing is you want to try to run it on slow if you can. And with a slow swing speed, you have a good chance of being able to have the machine tilt the processor to really pay attention to the fine gold and real stable ground. But the problem is, is with the slow speed, you're not gonna get a lot of target separation. Now, what does that mean? That means that there's a whole lot of targets and they're all close together. You're not likely to get good target separation in this slow speed. Now, if we go back to that and take it down to medium, and now you're saying, processor, I need you to be able to hear targets that are closer together a little bit more and maybe not be so sensitive to small gold. And then lastly, it's the last thing would be the opposite of that, which is on the other end from slow, you have now 
telling it I do want target separation and I don't care about depth and small gold. So it's a balancing act and there is more about that in your owner's manual. And then back to, and, and by the way, uh, uh, Garrett does recommend that you try to run that in slow if you can. All right, let's go back out to this. And then the last thing is ground track over here on the right. So what that is, is it has a lot to do with the, the thing we did earlier where we grabbed the ground. And by the way, let me just start out here by saying these two numbers right here, the 30 and the 23, the closer those numbers are together while you're swinging over ground, not targets, but just open ground, the closer those two numbers are together, the more stable the machine is and the better it's tracking. So right now I have tracking put on slow. And if I put that on fast, and back to the screen right here, within a couple of swings or two, it's more likely that those two numbers would get really close together and stay close together. Now, the issue with that is, is again, it's just like everything else, it's a balancing act, right? If you put it on ground track fast, you're losing depth. And you're telling the machine, hey, pay real close attention to the ground. The mineralization is changing frequently. And I want you to spend all your processing power chasing the ground and staying on top of all this changing mineralization and do that quickly, but you know you're gonna lose depth. So you, you don't wanna lose depth in most cases. You, you never wanna run fast. That's a problem setting. To be on fast means you're in big trouble that the ground is just crazy where you're at. So if you could, you could run this ideally on off and just do a ground grab and those numbers would stay close together in the middle and you'd be perfectly fine. But that's not likely. What you're more likely gonna to have to do is at least have it on slow and by having it on slow, it will tell the processor, hey, keep an eye on the ground for me. Don't make a big deal out of it. Give me lots of depth. And I want you to work on depth right now. And every once in a while, I'll check the mineralization and make sure that my numbers stay close together. So again, it's a balancing act. And then medium would be, you know, the best of both worlds is stick it right there. And I found that medium works perfect for me out here in California in the gold fields. So maybe that's a good setting for you to try to. But once you start swinging this thing around a little bit, you'd notice these two numbers would get really close together and kind of stay close together with it on medium. But I am losing a little bit of depth by dropping it to medium from slow. So, um, okay, I guess that's about it for everything here we talked about on this menu. Last thing I wanted to talk about was this button right here in the middle. If you hold this button in, it goes into an iron check mode. And what does that mean? That means that you can let me see if you can see that down there. Iron check hold. You see that where it says in the bottom right below that? Iron check hold. And what that means is that you would take the coil off the target slightly to the side of it. And then you would hold this button in. And while holding it in, you would bring the coil back over the signal, over back over the target, and swing back and forth while holding this in. And it would give you an audible low buzz if it was a iron target. To learn more about that, you might want to read your owner's manual and try that out in the field. It's pretty self-explanatory when you see it and do it for the first time, you'll, you'll get it to hang for it real quick. It's a neat feature that I wish all machines had, and I really like it on this machine. It's a great feature to have. We got a lot of bits of iron out here in the California gold fields. And where we're looking for gold, the old timers were looking for gold too, and they left all their square nails and junk everywhere. So it's almost always the case that we're going to be around iron when we're around the gold fields. So great feature to have. Last thing I want to talk about is the bar on the top up there. If I turn the sensitivity back up for a second, you can see that bar is going kind of crazy. Check out your owner's manual for that. That is a system that Garrett uses that says anything to the right is, well, first of all, it does two things. If it goes to the right, it's a high tone. If it goes to the left, it's a low tone. And then it also shows signal strength at the same time. So if it goes a little bit to the left, it's a little bit of a low tone. If it goes way to the right, it's a lot of a high tone, if you get what I'm saying. And what a low tone and a high tone is, is explained in your owner's manual. But generally speaking, they say that the smaller gold, fine gold, and, um, you know, like very small coins would show up as a high tone on the right side with an inflection to the right. So your gold nuggets, your smaller gold nuggets are going to go up this way to the right. And then your bigger gold nuggets and 
large, big conductors, like a big piece of aluminum from a can or something, would give you a big left inflection. So that's a little more detailed than that. You're going to want to read your owner's manual for that. But hey, that's the whole menu for this machine, and it's not bad. I mean, there's just this screen and this screen, and that's it. And um, the owner's manual is not a very big document. It doesn't need to be. There's nothing more to say about this than what I just said here. And there's a few more details, but it's not scary to use at all. And it's one of those machines that just one day out in the field, I think it'll have everything down and you won't feel like you don't know something about the machine. You'll know everything you need to know. And that's kind of what you need to get going. All right, and just a quick reminder before we end this video, the first thing you wanna do when you take this machine out is go ahead and try to find yourself a clean area in the ground where there's no signal. Turn your sensitivity up as high as you can. Start with max if you can. And then go ahead and do a ground grab by holding this in and pump the coil until you get a good stable number on there. And the next thing I would recommend to you is that you do a uh, frequency scan to make sure that there's a good that you're on a good channel and especially if you have another detectorist with you, have them turn on and do a frequency scan near them so that you can jump off of their channel. And then start messing with the finer details, you know, your swing speed and your ground tracking speed and dial it in, but you're good to go at that point. So I wish you all the luck out there and I know you'll do very well with this machine. It's a really nice machine at a good price. It's loaded with features and more importantly, it's very capable. It's right up there with all the top gold machines, very capable, lots of head to head testing videos on YouTube that you can watch and you can see that this thing is able to hold its own. So anyway, I'm glad that you uh, checked the video out and if you have any questions, something I didn't talk about, go ahead and leave me a comment down below. I read all my comments and respond to all of them. And uh, also you can leave me an email. There's an email in the description of all my videos. Send me an email, especially if it's a long detailed question. I'll do the best I can to get back to you. Okay, take care.